is a God who knows, who honors, who welcomes, and who empowers you to live into the creative call He has in your life when He first knit you together in your mother's womb. You are marvelous, you are necessary, and you are a gift to all of creation because God declares you His own. If you want to know what Christianity actually is, it's following Him. It's not lining up with culture. Jesus always does something wild. That's kind of fun. That's part of the adventure. Jesus Christ is the center. The one that holds all things together and is taking his church on a journey of changing the world for his sake. And that's what St. Andrews is all about. As we go into our sermon today, I just want to uh, ask you to pray with me to see that the Lord would maybe teach us something new. Father, thank you for um, how you communicate to us through your scripture. And as we've been taking a look at the book of Acts and all the stories that are in that book and the way you reveal yourself to us and the person of the Spirit, Lord, may we want to know you and want to know your spirit. May we allow and invite your spirit to guide us, teach us, Lord, for your sake and glory. In your name, amen. Thanks. I, I have a question to kind of start this off. When you think of the Holy Spirit, do you think of the Holy Spirit more as a noun or as a verb? I mean, a noun is, is kind of like, uh, this is the, who the Holy Spirit is. A verb is, this is what the Holy Spirit does. Do you tend to think more as of what the Holy Spirit does and how the Holy Spirit acts, or more as who the Holy Spirit is as this person, the fullness of God in His Spirit, whom He's given to us? That's what we're going to talk about as we go through this next text in Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26, is the Holy Spirit as guide. Is the Holy Spirit a guide who's a verb that guides us? Or is the Holy Spirit the guide as a person? And the best way I know how to describe this to you is um, for a lot of years, I, I had this fishing trip with some really good friends, and we used to go up to Yellowstone up in Montana, and we would all fish a lot of the rivers there. And we found out about this place called Lake Hebgen. And the Hebgen Lake is known for the Hebgen gulpers. Now, the Hebgen gulpers are really famous fish. They're way bigger than the average trout in the U.S. And they also are way stronger. There's just a certain uh, chemistry makeup in this lake. And they're very hard to catch, the Hebgen gulpers. And so we decided this one year, talked about it for a year, we're going to go catch a Hebgen gulper. So we went in uh, the day before we wanted to go to Hebgen Lake. And we went into this fly shop in Yellowstone. Uh, we asked the guy, can you help us? We want to catch fish at Hepkin Lake. We want to catch a gulper. Now, he could have done one of two things. He could have acted as a verb. He could have been a really great um, salesperson and said, okay, you need these flies, this flies, here's the map, go, go get them, and just send us on our way. And it ultimately would be up to us. He did his task. He empowered us to go catch these fish. Or he could have been something more than that for us. We wanted this great adventure. And actually, as it turned out, he was actually someone who would not just guide us, but who would be our guide. And what he did was he told us to be there the next morning at 6 o'clock, and he'd have float tubes for us. We showed up. He had been there before, checked out the lake, made sure everything was ready, had these float tubes ready, gave us coffee, drove us all excited. He was there with us as we put our float tubes in the water. He floated with us. He not only equipped us, but he taught us and he whispered in our ears and he showed us how these special fish actually rise to a fly. And I'm not a great fly fisherman, but I had great luck because my guide, this person, was right next to me. And I caught those two, the first two of those Hepkin gulpers 
Um, and what an adventure. Why do I share a story like that when we're talking about the Holy Spirit? Because we're going to get to our text where the Holy Spirit actually acts as guide to one of the disciples named Philip. It's in Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26. If you want to grab a Bible, let's take a look at it together. Who is this Holy Spirit? Acts chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, who happened to be in Samaria at the time, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot. And stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked him. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come on up and sit with him. And they read Isaiah 53. Then in verse 34, the eunuch said to Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip, verse 35, began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop his chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. You know, Philip had this experience with the Holy Spirit that wasn't all that unlike our experience on Hepkin Lake. Our guide who acted as a noun. He was guide. He went before us. He told us where to go and took us there. He equipped us to be there and have the adventure of our lives. Now, these same things happened to Philip. Philip was in Samaria having an incredible ministry. And then a couple of other disciples were up there with him. And somehow, in verse 26, the Holy Spirit spoke to Philip and said, Philip, I need you to go and arise. That's in the original language. Not just, Philip, I want you to go, but go and get up and head to that road, that desert road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And he basically says, I'm going with you, Philip. And as he does, then he doesn't know what he's going to face. And so then the Holy Spirit speaks to him again and said, see that chariot up there? Go run and catch up to it. Run and catch up to it. I've got something in store for you, Philip. And then the story you hear. He, he has this beautiful encounter with this, this very powerful official from Ethiopia. And they sit together and this man gives his life to Christ. Then out of nowhere on this desert road, there's water right after that. And the eunuch says to Philip, oh, let me get baptized now. So they stop and Philip baptizes him. Then again, the spirit moves. He whisks Philip away. We don't know how that happened. It doesn't tell us, but he goes in these neighboring towns, ultimately to Caesarea. Look at what the Holy Spirit does. Yes. He acts as a verb. The Holy Spirit acts as a guide. He does do the action of guiding. But he's more than that. What happens with Philip in Acts 8 and throughout the book of Acts and throughout the whole of Scripture, as God reveals himself to us, he is more than just a distant guide, a powerful force who acts, who maybe tells us stuff and then sends us on our way to go do it. He's more than that. He actually is our guide. He's a noun. Guide is a descriptor of who God is. Just like that guide who took us to Hepkin Lake, so is our God. The spirit of the Lord that God has given us resides within us. 
That's what the book of Acts teaches, is God is much more a noun who, yes, acts. But as he acts, he acts with his presence right with us, equipping us, giving us all we need to know as we move forward in our lives. So how do we actually access this spirit? How do we hear this spirit more than just an action, a, a distant power that tells us what to do? How do we engage in the presence of the one who has come as our guide, who is with us and in us? Well, it seems like there's kind of a, a three-step process. It's not linear, but it's more inside out. How do we hear the voice of the spirit? Philip heard it in Samaria. Philip heard it when he's on that road. Then as he's with this Ethiopian official, he hears it by the presence of this water. How, how do we hear? Well, at the very core, the most important thing for us as we follow Christ is that we learn how to listen to the Spirit speak. We must listen to the Spirit speak. The voice of God will and is speaking to you and to me. The tough thing is how do we know it's the Spirit and how do we hear that Spirit? There's a lot of conjecture and a lot of people say different things about this, but let's just look at the Scriptures, not just Philip, but throughout the Scriptures, is listening to that voice, is listening to that voice speaking to us on behalf of Jesus and His kingdom. As Stan Jantz puts it in his book, Wind and Fire, is the Holy Spirit is always about Jesus. Stan says that in his book. Man, so what, what do you do to listen to the Spirit? Well, some people say you just try to figure out what your life options are and then give the Spirit the ability to help you choose your options. Do I go to this college or that college? Do I take that job or that job? Do I marry this person or maybe wait and find a different person? How do I know the will of God? You know, Here's one thing we need to remember is that as the Spirit prompts us, the Spirit will always lead us into the place and places where God wants to use us, wants to take us to the great adventure He's designed us for. And so therefore, in Philippians 4, for example, He says, pray about everything. Don't be anxious about anything. Pray about anything you want. So yeah, we ought to do that as we listen to the voice. And, and in John 14 Verse 14, Jesus even says, um, ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. So it's listening to the voice, just inviting God to come from the outside, look at our circumstances as we point out the various options and then saying, Lord, do I get that car or that car? Let's see, the, the Tesla or the Beamer. What do you think, Lord? That's actually not what Jesus is talking about in John 14. Because in John 14, 14, he says, ask whatever you want in my name and I will give it to you. To listen to the voice of Jesus Christ is to ask in his name, is to listen in his name. What does that mean? It means to listen for his purposes, to listen for his options. Philip is sitting in Samaria having this great ministry. A couple of the other disciples are up there with him. It's unbelievable what's taking place. And literally out of the blue, the Holy Spirit comes to him. It's not like Philip said, um, should I stay here for two years or three years, Lord? It's as he followed Christ, as he was attuned with the Spirit, he heard the Spirit speaking to him. And he knew he had to arise and go. Arise and go. Then he's on this road that he couldn't understand. He didn't give the Lord a series of options. He simply was on that road with what he knew. And the Lord spoke to him again. To listen to the voice is to learn what it means to listen. Not to tell God, here are my circumstances. Now please bless them. Here are my choices. Tell me the best one for me to go. It's instead of laying out our options for him, we listen for his calling to us. To listen to that voice might and often does change everything. And are we willing to listen? Is our faith the kind of faith 
that simply asks God to bless the life and the options we've chosen, or is it to actually listen to his purposes in the world for his sake and his kingdom? So that's how we learn to listen to the voice. How, how, do, you, how do you know if we're right about that? What if the Spirit is speaking to us about a person that they want us to meet or a place he wants us to go? Well, the second thing we need to do that goes out of that is to make sure we are living our lives in community, some sort of community. Philip, we don't know he actually talked to these other disciples in Samaria in verse 25 and 26, but what we do know is that Philip was with them. So he hears the voice of the Spirit. He hears the voice of this messenger. And somehow he responds. Perhaps he invited them into the conversation. Now, that's what we need to do too. So the first thing is to listen to the voice. The second is to take our impressions of what we hear from God by the Spirit and to invite others into that conversation to try to say, Lord, is this what you mean? Brothers and sisters that help us to understand this, not random folks, but people that know us well and love Christ. To hear the Spirit is not only hearing from the inside, but also hearing through those we're in intimate community with. So we need to listen to each other. We need to help each other to listen to the Spirit, to be sensitive and careful, to be in tune with what that Spirit is saying, because the Spirit is always speaking to you and always speaking to me. Is our prayer life a life of listening? of dropping our options and seeking to know his call. Those are the first two, the inside listens. Secondly, listen with others. But there is a third layer that we always need to factor in. For Philip and for the other disciples in the book of Acts, this didn't seem to matter. They had their lives arranged so they were absolutely free to go anywhere and do anything. The Apostle Paul and others, they went out as the Spirit prompted them. But we must take very seriously our world circumstances. For example, let's say in your heart you get this call. You sense you need to move from where you live and move to another place because God seems to be saying that to you. So you bring that to good friends and you discuss that and you pray about that together. And Maybe they affirm it, maybe they don't. But here's this third layer of what are your circumstances say? Let's say you're married let's say you're newly married and have a little boy let's say his name happens to be teddy for example and you get this impression that you're supposed to get up and leave what about your wife and child you have made a commitment and a covenant that god has called you to our circumstances in life must come into play of hearing god's voice clearly because god would never ask you to violate a covenant you made before him especially to a spouse and to children. But as our spouse and our children are also doing the same thing, listening to the Spirit, perhaps God would be leading all of you to radical change. This is so hard. I know that this is hard. For so many of us, our faith is really just about how we get God to bless our lives or asking God to somehow tell us which choice to make as we set those choices up before him. But the Holy Spirit is not just a powerful force that tells us go that way instead of that way. He's not just a verb. The Holy Spirit is a noun. The Holy Spirit is a person that lives within us that is constantly calling us and prompting us to be in tune with what the Spirit is doing in the world and wants to use us to take us to these heights we can never imagine. Philip didn't know what he's going to face once he's walking on that road and you and I don't know. But will you allow the Spirit to be your guide? What a beautiful and powerful calling where Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. He gives us his Spirit, the person, the noun, the God, who says, I will take you. Hear my voice. Arise and go.